time to start. Let me just um, do the full screen thing then. Okay, I'm hoping that everybody can hear me. And if there's any problems, just send me an email and I will glance at my uh, inbox in another window um, on another machine, just in case uh, you need to get in touch with me urgently. Anyway, thanks for joining this tutorial. And uh, yes, so total search problems in economics and computation. And this is joint with um, Alexandra Solander, who will give the next uh, 45 minute slot. So. I think the general idea is that the, the split between my talk and his is that I'm going to introduce the complexity classes of interest and explain how we basically containment of uh, various problems of interest in these complexity classes and how that works. And then he's going to work on the uh, techniques for proving hardness. So a general comment then, as you can see from my first slide, is that there are quite a lot of computational problems coming from economics which uh, have this special property that there are solutions that are guaranteed to exist and uh, seem to be hard to compute in the worst case. So uh, a few well-known examples like a pure strategy equilibria of congestion games. In general, mixed strategy equilibria of games in general, perhaps that's the, uh, the main problem of interest. Um, Arrow de Bruyne markets and various other kinds of markets where there exist prices that clear the markets. And then in the context of um, fair division, there are notions of uh, fair sharing which um, have guaranteed existence results for which we don't know how to uh, how to efficiently compute them so uh, that's um the thing that kind of glues these disparate problems together is this special property of guaranteed existence and i should also add for completeness that um if we're shown a solution, we can actually check quite easily that it really is a solution. And that's an important fact in the context of game theory. You'd like to know when um, the game is over, when you are really uh, doing something from um, that you're happy to carry on doing. So my focus of my talk today is going to be on the two, uh, the two main complexity classes of interest, namely PLS and PPAD. And uh, we'll take a look at what kind of problems belong to these classes and what kind of problems are complete for them. And I'll um, touch on uh, one or two other classes as well as um, how they get combined in certain special problems of interest. So to begin with, let me tell you, um, show you some examples. And uh, congestion games then, this is a well-known class of games that have been intensively studied over the years. Maybe about 15 years ago, there was a kind of peak of study of congestion games in our community, but they're still, they're still coming up quite regularly. And in a congestion game, it's uh, generally it's a special kind of multiplayer game where let's let n be the number of players. Let's number them one through n. And the players have access to a set of so-called resources. I'll let R be the set of resources. And uh, let's assume there are M of them. And so uh, just looking at general remark then is that a congestion game gives us a way of concisely representing a multiplayer game. So recall that if um, in general, if I talk, if I want to uh, present the game that's got say just two or three players and each player has got some largish number of, of pure strategies, I could in principle write them out in normal form, meaning that for each combination of pure strategies, I write down their um, payoffs to each player. Of course, as the number of players increases, the number of pure strategy combinations blows up exponentially and we have to have a concise way of writing down such a game and congestion games are an important subclass of such games and they work as follows. So we'll say that each resource has a, a non-decreasing delay or cost which refers to, which defines the, the cost experienced by a player who uh, uses that particular resource. And by the way, it's maybe helpful just looking ahead slightly to think in terms of a 
an important subclass of congestion games, namely network congestion games, in which a player wants to route a flow from a source to a destination. And uh, as you might expect, the amount of uh, the cost of using an edge in this network or a path goes up as the amount of traffic on that path increases. More abstractly, we can just say um, each player has got access to the set of resources. There is some cost function, one for each resource. And in general, we can say that any, any player I has got a strategy set, um, SI, which uh, is a subset of the, um, let's see, each, each pure strategy is a subset of the resources. And if I use a collection of resources, then the cost that I pay to use them is the total cost of the individual resources in that, um, in that set, um, little s. So uh, notice, of course, that uh, in general, if uh, I have two pure strategies and one of them is a subset of the other one, then the smaller set would be uh, would be a better pure strategy to, th to use than the larger one. So in general, of course, we would concentrate on the uh, minimal subsets in this collection that a player has access to. Right, so that's a congestion game. It's quite a natural concept. And uh, here's the key point about them, which is that if we have a pure strategy profile, that is to say, for each player, they each player identifies a pure strategy in that um, amongst his allowed uh, pure strategies. Then if we let um, Fs of R be the number of players using resource R in pure profile S, let us um, denote, let's, let's um, define the so-called Rosenthal potential, which is this um, very important concept on the uh, displayed formula here. And by the way, uh, just to note that the relevant paper is by now quite old, uh, as you might expect for a very fundamental concept in game theory. And the Rosenthal potential of a strategy profile is the sum over all the resources of um, for each resource, we're going to take another sum consisting of the sum from j equals one to um, fs, the number of players using that resource of the uh, delay function associated with um, number j. So without me trying too hard to give you an intuitive uh, discussion of why we introduced this particular function, note the key property of it, which is um, which is this one here, which is that if you analyze it, you can uh, determine without too much effort, in fact, that the value of this function always goes down if a player makes a better response. So uh, if a player finds a move that improves his own payoff, then the value of the, uh, of the new strategy profile will be less than, the potential of the new strategy profile will be less than what it used to be. And what that means straight away is that pure Nash equilibria always exist because there are only finitely many choices of pure profiles. And as this, this function can only go down so often, and so ultimately we'll reach some minimum, some local minimum within the collection, although clearly a global minimum exists. And uh, from that point, no player can improve um, his payoff or rather reduce his cost any further. And that's a pure Nash equilibrium. This is a good thing for, well, for two reasons. One of them is that Pure Nash equilibria, when they exist, are a, a natural and more satisfying solution than mixed strategy Nash equilibria. It's kind of reasonable to believe that each player would like to choose a single, um, a single pure strategy from his collection. And the other um, thing that makes it even nicer is that the proof um, of this um, existence it conveys an obvious uh, approach for finding pure strategy Nash equilibria. Namely, what each player ought to do is simply do best response dynamics. At any point in time, let's allow any player who can improve his payoff to do so. Just repeatedly do that until we can make no further um, gains, no further progress. And so this is great because um, we have a simple algorithm. And not only that, the simple algorithm in question um, represents a sort of natural model of how players might behave in real life. So uh, 
that's a very nice thing about congestion games, explains a lot about why they are um, considered to be important and interesting and so on, and their natural class of games. And uh, this leads us into the concept of polynomial local search, which uh, I'm just going to define uh, informally on this slide, and I'm going to define it rather more carefully a little bit later. Um, the complexity class PLS is due to this uh, old paper, Johnson, Pepper, Dimitri, and Yanakakis. How easy is local search? And this is problems of discrete local optimization, not um, you know particularly game theoretic ones necessarily. Indeed, in the early days, uh, um, some of the main ones were associated with the traveling salesman problem and the search for locally optimal solutions of the traveling salesman problem, according to uh, various um, various heuristic approaches for improving on solutions repeatedly. So uh, coming back to game theory, let's notice that um, what a PLS problem really is. It consists of... Uh, any computational search problem where there is a large solution space, and here I'm thinking about pure profiles of a congestion game. And the other ingredient is that if we're given an element of the solution space, it ought to be possible to tell easily in polynomial time, that is to say, if it is locally optimal. And if the solution is not locally optimal, then there is a local neighborhood which can be investigated and um, if it's not locally optimal, there will be some improved solution, call it S prime, where um, some potential function associated with this uh, PLS problem has got a smaller value on S prime than it has on S. And any problem with this general structure basically is a PLS problem, um, polynomial local search. Polynomial refers to uh, two things. One of them is that it should be possible to tell in polynomial time that a solution is locally optimal. And if, it is not, if it's not locally optimal, there should exist some uh, easy to find improved solution. And uh, as I note, there are many PLS problems. Take a look at the Wikipedia page on PLS. There are a huge collection of them listed there. So let me just continue by telling you briefly about another couple of PLS problems that come from algorithmic game theory in particular. And another example uh, I'm using here is uh, a problem of fair division, which is of uh, quite a considerable current interest. There seems to be quite a, um, a flurry of papers coming out on this general topic at the moment. Um, basically, the idea is that we want to, uh, I'll tell you what EFX means in just a minute. So uh, we have a set of agents and a set of items. And let's assume that the, um, the num that this is a finite collection of items and the items are all indivisible. So we want to do our best to share the items amongst the agents, which means partitioning this set M of items into N subsets, which uh, do not overlap, of course. And uh, what we're trying to achieve here um, is based on valuation functions that the agents have. In general, a valuation function is um, a way that the agent values subsets of this collection of items. And so it's a function from subsets of the items to non-negative real numbers. And the objective is to partition M into N bundles such that if we just allocate them to the agents, then uh, we've got a notion called EFX envy freeness, which basically means that if I'm an agent and I've received a subset of the bundles, then if we take a look at any of the other subsets allocated to any of the other agents, then if I remove any item from one of those alternative bundles, I will value it less than the uh, bundle that I myself have been allocated. Now, uh, it's easy to note that we cannot be entirely NV free because simply if we have two agents and a single item, we can only allocate it to one item. But um, straight away, we can see that a simple um, example like that is indeed EFX NV free. 
I should emphasize that at the moment, I am just assuming that all agents have the same valuation function. It is an interesting open problem to see um, whether this um, trick can be done for agents with diverse valuation functions, but I'm not going to go there. Let's just assume they've got the same valuation function. And uh, it's um, so here's the point. We can, there's an existence result saying that there exist there exists an EFX NV free allocation of these indivisible items um, due to Plout and Rough Garden quite recently. And here's how it's proved very roughly. We say, uh, suppose that we have a partition of the items. Let's call the partition A. And so it's a union, I should say, a disjoint union of A1 through AN. Then uh, Let's assume that um, we've um, arranged these AIs in such a way that the value of AI is at most the value of AI plus one. And furthermore, we should um, choose a large number K, which is, um, it should be large relative to the size of M and the value of any bundle. Then uh, there is a complicated looking uh, potential function that I've written down here. And I do not propose to discuss it or try to motivate it um, right now. Just um, take a quick look at it. It's a function of the values of bundles and the sizes of bundles. And the general point is that if we try to maximize this potential function, um, then actually, I think I should be saying minimize this potential function. If we try to do this uh, by simple steps of moving one item from one bundle to another, then uh, the function, the potential function will indeed go down as we would hope for a potential function. And when it's as low as it can be, that means that no, um, no bundles can be improved any further in a sense. And uh, we can claim that the resulting, uh, the resulting partition of the set of items is indeed NV free in this um, in this sense. So uh, that's another example that also comes from game theory, and it's quite a nice one. So, uh, like I say, I'm going to spare you the details of this function and the analysis of it. But um, let me just move on to uh, one more example, and this is really quite a, a simple and straightforward one which um, can be thought of as a party affiliation game. And uh, let's see what's going on here. Imagine we have a set of agents and uh, let's as before, let's assume N is the number of agents. And for each pair of agents, we have a, we know to what extent these two agents like each other. Um, in fact, actually, I think I should be saying, um, an, an edge, okay, agents are vertices of this graph. An edge of the graph really represents how much the agents uh, dislike each other. And uh, we'd like them to um, sort themselves out into two parties or two groups in such a way as to uh, maximize the number of, maximize the weight of edges that go between these two groups, which essentially means that um, you have uh, maximize the, you're, you're looking for a maximum cut in a graph corresponding to uh, an agent who, uh, corresponding to the idea that an agent would like to stay away from the uh, other agents that he dislikes and he would like to stay with the other agents that he likes. And uh, this becomes a kind of, basically this becomes a local max cut problem. An agent will be happy to stay on one side of a one partition of this graph provided that if um, if he moves from one side to the other, um, take a look at, say, the agents who's got degree three on this top left-hand side here. Um, if he moves to the other side, then the weight of the, weight of the cut of the graph would go up. Um, sorry, it would go down. And that would correspond to um, an agent uh, making a move which reduces his utility. So, uh, he would like to, he's trying to uh, find, uh, so basically all the agents are trying to find a local max cut. So that this is what a solution corresponds to. And uh, briefly then, this is a PLS problem. So uh, 
with regards to the word local, okay, for forgetting about the game theory motivation for the moment, so let's just think about local max cut, where the notion of locality simply means if I take a cut of the graph and I take a look at its weight, in my example, the weight of the cut is 12 to weight, two edges of weight six. Um, if I move any one vertex of the graph from one side to the other, the weight of the graph will go down. So even though in my example, you can probably see a cut of value 20 of obtained by drawing a horizontal line instead of a vertical one, that would be globally maximum, but not locally maximum. And the one that I've indicated is in fact locally maximum. So uh, this is an example of a PLS problem since we can, as before, evaluate quite easily the weight of any cut of a graph. And we can also check quite easily whether it's locally maximum. And so if we iterate the process of moving one vertex from one side of the graph to the other, then we uh, will eventually find a local maximum cut. And once again, uh, Local search um, works pretty well in practice, but we're going to see that um, it is, um, it's got a problem that is reminiscent of quanti quantitative easing. And uh, you, some of you may remember a quote of uh, Ben Bernanke, former US Fed chairman, who said, the problem with QE is that it works well in practice, but it doesn't work in theory. So uh, that is, um, why is that like local search? It's because these local search problems don't seem to work well in theory. They do not seem to have polynomial time algorithms, crucially. Um, so technically what this is saying is that these problems belong to um, FNP as opposed to FP, which is to say functions which are checkable in, in um, polynomial time. But um, okay, so input output pairs in particular can be efficiently checked. We can check that a local max cut is indeed a local max cut, but it's hard to um, compute a local max cut in polynomial time. Although, like I say, there is an interesting gap between theory and practice in the sense that local search does well in practice, as indeed uh, digressing slightly, uh, problems in PPAD often seem to have uh, efficient, practically efficient algorithms. And I think it's, uh, it's an interesting research direction to understand better this kind of anomaly. But um, for the moment, let's just focus on the fact that these problems do not seem to have polynomial time algorithms. In fact, they don't even have known uh, um, sub-exponential time algorithms a lot of the time. Okay, and uh, let's focus on the uh, problems in PLS, which I've so far um, focused on. These problems are in particular the ones I've shown you. They're said to be PLS complete. And uh, this, this means two things. It, it's evidence that they are likely to not have polynomial time algorithms. And uh, I'm also going to emphasize that it um, suggests that they're unlikely to be NP-hard, which is kind of the, uh, the, the important, um, you know, the, mode, the gold standard, if you like, of um, computational hardness. Now, uh, let's just look at PLS completeness first. So PLS then, um, so these problems, um, a kind of reducible to a rather more generic looking local optimization problem. And uh, the basic idea is of the definition of PLS is the following. We define into existence a local optimization problem, which um, um, in this uh, Johnson et al paper is um, introduced as FLIP. And um, it's defined as follows. The idea is to make it sort of very general looking while still being a polynomial local search problem. And an instance of flip is given by a Boolean circuit, and it's got an, some number of inputs and some number of outputs. Um, so if M is the number of inputs and N is the number of outputs of this Boolean circuit, then uh, the search space is going to be bit strings of length M, which is to say bit strings that can be plugged into this circuit as an input string. And then what we do is that we say, an output of the circuit can be regarded as an integer in the range uh, one through two to the n. And uh, the local optimum of um, defined um, in terms of this circuit is a bit string s, 
such that if we regard the circuit as a function that it um, that um, computes inputs to outputs, it's got the property that C of S is less than or less, less than or equal to C of S prime for any bit string S prime that is Hamming distance one from S. Now, the big idea of this problem flip is um, note that it's defined in terms of a circuit and it's got this quite um, general looking notion of locality. And the idea of the definition is that it's defined in such a way that all other local search problems can in fact be reduced in polynomial time to flip. They can be converted into instances of flip in such a way that any solution to the corresponding instance of flip allows you to de derive from it an instance to the solution of the problem that you started out with. So PLS then, flip is PLS complete by definition and any other problem is PLS complete if in fact we can reduce from flip to that alternative problem. In particular then, it turns out that um, congestion, the problem that I showed you first, is indeed PLS complete, which uh, should make us unhappy as suggested by my emoji down there. And uh, that was due to uh, this Fabricant et al paper back in 2004. And as you might expect, there are various contrasting positive results for special cases of congestion games. So anyway, that's what we know. That's the basic fact that we know about this um, congestion problem. Good. OK, now the other um, fact that I uh, wanted to emphasize is the contrast with NP hardness. And I noted that NP hardness is the kind of gold standard of computational difficulty. So uh, should we be really saying, uh, asking, the, asking ourselves the question, can satisfiability reduce to congestion? Why did we have to reduce from this uh, relatively novel problem called flip? And the key point here is that uh, we don't think it's possible. This um, congestion cannot be NP hard unless NP is equal to co NP. And this is due to quite a simple, um, a simple argument really that I can basically explain to you, which is that if we um, look at the satisfiability problem SAT, of course it's got yes instances and no instances. And if I try to reduce SAT to congestion, I face the problem, what should happen to all those no instances? And uh, any, any instance of congestion will have an easily checkable solution. And that would presumably give me a certificate for um, any one of these no instances, which would imply NP equals to co NP. So we have this really quite straightforward reason why in fact, um, any problem like um, any, um, essentially any total search problem cannot be NP complete, um, barring this um, unlikely uh, outcome. So uh, let's define the complexity class TFNP, total functions that are um, checkable in uh, polynomial time, solvable in non-deterministic polynomial time, therefore. And uh, PLS is just um, some of these problems. So in the remaining time, I'm going to tell you about other, um, some of the other ones, in particular, the ones that belong to this complexity class PPAD. Right, so uh, a quick diagram. Uh, there is a, um, this is a sort of simplified uh, diagram of the main complexity classes that are subsets of TFNP. And in the context of economics and computing, I think it's fair to say that um, PLS and PPAD are the most important ones. CLS is also important and um, PPA is somewhat important. So PPP, not so very much so. Um, and these subclasses of TFNP, they all have complete problems. TFNP itself does not have complete problems, um, we think. So let me just um, tell you about PPAD completeness. So PPAD then, it corresponds to an alternative non-efficiently constructible proof principle. So in the case of PLS, that was the idea of local optimality. In the case of PPAD, it corresponds to the idea of a so-called parity argument on a directed graph, where the general idea is as shown in this diagram here. Um, let's see what's going on. You can see 
a vertex of this graph colored red. You can also see that the graph in question is a, it's a directed graph and every vertex of it has got in degree at most one and out degree at most one, which means that topologically it um, consists of a bunch of paths and directed paths and directed cycles. Now, if I show you a vertex like this red one here, then that gives you a kind of guarantee that there exist other degree one vertices. And in my picture, they are shown with yellow stars on them. Those are solutions. Those are what you're looking for. And I've drawn this graph in a purposefully um, cluttered way to indicate that it's meant to be, um, the graph is meant to, meant to be rather hard to navigate in the sense that if I show you a vertex of the graph, you can find its neighbors, but it's a bit hard to uh, just by looking at it, um, understand its uh, general structure and find degree one vertices within it. Now, uh, in more detail then, the idea of the PPAD complexity class is that it's defined like PLS, it's got a way possible. And uh, thinking about this uh, existence of degree one vertices in a directed graph. So to be clear, um, you're shown a, um, a particular degree one vertex in the directed graph. The challenge is to find some, some other degree one vertex, not the one you're shown, of course. Um, you've got this parity argument that says that there must be an odd number of solutions. So there exists at least one solution. So uh, how do we make a difficult problem out of this? And the big idea is that we uh, define a, an exponentially large graph in terms of circuits. So we have these two circuits that I'm calling um, successor and predecessor. And let's suppose that they each have n, input, n inputs and n outputs. So we've got a graph on two to the n vertices as shown in the picture. And what these circuits do is that if I take any bit string, say U or V, if I plug U into the successor vertex and I get V, and then I plug P into V into the predecessor vertex and I get U, then uh, between them, those two circuits are telling you that there is an edge between uh, a directed edge from U to V in this large graph. Now, as a, as a consequence of that, we're able to do local exploration on the graph. Given any vertex, we can identify both of its neighbors, but we cannot, of course, um, just um, efficiently by brute force check every vertex to find one of to find a, a vertex of degree one. So let's assume that the all zeros vertex um, corresponds to the red node of the graph. And we will just constrain the circuit so that the all zeros vertex does indeed have um, a single outgoing edge. So with that in place, we have a guarantee that somewhere out there in the two to the n vertices, there exists another one, which if we could only find would be easy to check by just plugging it into those two circuits. On the other hand, finding it in the first place has become a challenging problem. So. Uh, the general point of this definition is that we have um, defined a problem in such a way as to apply the apply this parity argument principle in a way that is as general as possible to make a problem that um, has the has the feature that any other problem that um, we um, that uses this principle to guarantee existence of solutions can indeed be reduced to the problem end of line. And I hope it's clear where the end of line name comes from. It just comes from the fact that we're looking for a degree, a degree one vertex, one that, that sits at the end of one of these paths in the graph. OK. So, uh, all right, what has this got to do with a Nash equilibrium computation? Uh, so, Basically, in a nutshell, the, the Nash problem, the very basic version of this problem would say we've got a two player game presented in the form of the row player and the column players payoff matrices. And uh, this problem is indeed reducible to end of line. And so um, it also turns out to be um, the reduction works in the other way. Um, it is PPAD complete. So uh, that is uh, considered to be an unfortunate fact then. This also holds for um, 
any constant uh, number k of players and uh, in the context of approximate Nash equilibria. So as an important side note, when we uh, look at games of more than two players, in general, there may be, it, they, they may have, um, ex their exact Nash equilibria may be irrational numbers. And so this raises an inconvenient problem of how to represent such solutions. And a quick fix to say to that is to say, um, actually, let's just take an interest in approximate Nash equilibrium, where we replace the no incentive to deviate with a small incentive to deviate. And it turns out that even this weaker solution concept, the problem remains PPAD hard. So uh, this is good to know in the sense that we uh, we have this um, hardness result. And indeed, for many classes of problems, many classes of multiplayer games, not just, uh, OK, um, such as I've just listed a few here um, for polymatrix games and various special cases of them and also anonymous games and a whole lot of others which I um, will not even attempt to review. There are many PPAD completeness results known for um, games having other structures. So let's see, um, in the time I've got left, uh, let me just give you a hint about the containment in PPAD since I said I was going to uh, focus on containment in these in these complexity classes PLS and PPAD and then I will just briefly touch on the um, the um, their intersection the complexity class PLS sorry CLS so in the uh, thinking about games then uh, I can just give you a sketchy idea so thinking about the domain of mixed strategies of say a two-player game or a three-player game, basically the, the thing to notice is that the player strategy set sits in kind, it sits in a simplex. It's a set of, um, uh, it's um, all probability distributions over his, uh, over his pure strategy profile. So he's basically um, able to choose a point in a simplex, which um, is an element of his um, mixed strategy space. And uh, if we just pretend, um, this is an, an oversimplification, pretend that this triangle is the space of all the players' uh, mixed strategies, then what we have is a kind of convex region in multidimensional um, multi Euclidean space. And I'm just pretending for convenience that it's a triangle just to give you the general idea. And we can color code, okay, now um, let's take a look at the arrows in the triangle here. You'll notice that at each, uh, I've divided the triangle up into a bunch of grid points. And at each grid point, I've um, given that, um, I've given it a direction, which basically corresponds to the direction that the players want to move in. Typically, if I choose a mixed strategy profile, then the players, if I'm not at a Nash equilibrium, then one or more players will want to move. And so we can define a function which just um, identifies the direction in which the players want to move. Now, uh, the next trick is to color code the directions, which is um, indicated just to the top left of this, of this um, triangle. And uh, by choosing this particular color coding, we actually have um, two things going on. There are certain boundary conditions that result, such as the fact that on each edge of the triangle, each edge of the triangle um, can only be one of two colors and not all three of them. The three vertices of the triangle, the kind of extreme cases where players are playing pure strategies, uh, these have um, distinct colors from each other. And um, an approximate Nash equilibrium is going to take place essentially intuitively at a, at a small triangle, somewhere near a, a small triangle where all three colors are close to each other. Because when that happens, we have the uh, feature that the directions in question are kind of competing against each other. And we shown that kind of suggests that we are somewhere near a fixed point of this function. So uh, 
Let us note in passing that we can do this trick at various grid resolutions. And so if, for example, I increase the grid resolution, it's, um, it's not too hard to take a look at any point in this domain. Identify the direction of travel that the players would like to make and check efficiently whether I'm um, somewhere near a place where, where all three colors are actually close to each other which I would do by looking at neighboring vertices of a tiny triangle in the domain. Now, uh, for containment in PPAD then, we have, let's see, I'm running a bit low on time, unfortunately, but let me just try and give you the idea. Um, recall that PPAD problems, uh, to reduce the problem, um, we have to reduce to this end of line problem. And, uh, and I do that by constructing a directed graph that's got degree two and um, where solutions correspond to these uh, uh, triangles, tiny triangles, where there are all three colors close to each other, namely at the vertices of the triangle. And the idea is that to do this, I'm going to put an edge, each, each vertex of the graph will be one of the tiny triangles. I've also got a, a, a line of vertices along the top left-hand uh, edge of this triangle. And I connect two of these vertices to each other, if and only if there is a red-blue edge that um, cross that they cross. So where you see an arrow, in, arrow inside the tri triangular region, you'll notice that it crosses a red-blue edge and the, um, it crosses it in such a way that the red is on the left and blue is on the right. That gives you the orientation of the graph. And to complete this picture, I have to have some an additional collection of edges that um, go along the red-blue side of the big triangle, starting at the bottom left-hand side. And I have an edge which um, connects any pair of vertices which essentially sit above um, a blue vertex that's adjacent to it on the edge of this big triangle. Now, uh, putting all that together, we can uh, notice that this gives us a large graph. So here's the basic point, an exponentially large graph, which um, has, a, has a known starting vertex, namely the one on the bottom left. And uh, any solution corresponds to the special panchromatic uh, tiny triangles where we um, have reason to believe that we're at an approximate Nash equilibrium because all three directions of motion are present and competing against each other. Okay, so good. I've got a minute or two left. Um, I've told you about PPAD and PP uh, and uh, PLS. Um, let me just briefly define the complexity class CLS down here, which... Uh, so I'm going to skip PPA, which is also uh, very interesting, but let me just uh, tell you a bit about CLS in the remaining minute that I've got. Continuous local search, introduced originally uh, by this in this paper of Daskalakis and Papadimitriou, which um, is motivated by the observation that there are quite a lot of interesting problems coming from game theory and elsewhere, which belong to both PPAD and PLS. And so accordingly, we believe they are unlikely to be complete for either of those. We think PPAD and PLS are distinct from each other. And so uh, briefly then, here's one of them. The GD for gradient descent is given a smooth function on a compact domain. Find a point where gradient descent doesn't get any local improvement. So uh, let me just skip to the punchline. I will... Um, skip past this nice diagram that is, well, this diagram, which uh, is a hint that um, the problem belongs to both PPAD and PLS. And uh, our state of knowledge then is, um, is written down here. So uh, if we um, ask about the uh, complexity of mixed Nash equilibrium in congestion games, then uh, this problem has an interesting status because it belongs to PPAD simply because um, it's a problem of finding a mixed Nash equilibrium. It also belongs to PLS for reasons that I told you at the start. And uh, 
it turns out to be complete for CLS, which um, according to a paper by myself and Alex and, uh, and these uh, co-authors here, um, CLS is indeed the intersection of PPAD and PLS. So uh, we have some uh, recent and quite satisfying results, which uh, tell us some interesting stuff about the complexity of these, of this uh, interesting problem of congestion games. So uh, uh, with that, I will uh, break off. And uh, I hope Alex has been answering questions, if there were any, and we can uh, we can now chat.